Good afternoon. I'm Holly Bohart, Senior Editor of Books and Related Resources at NAEYC. I'd like to welcome you to this webinar that celebrates our book, Making and Tinkering, Solving Design Challenges with Young Children. We're excited that the book's author, Kate Harriman, is with us today to share new tips and ideas for implementing STEM concepts using everyday materials that will help nurture, design, and build solutions. Kate is Education Chair and Vice Chair of Knock Knock Children's Museum in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. A nationally recognized educator and author of numerous publications, she has been an early childhood classroom teacher, state administrator, trainer, facilitator, keynote speaker, consultant, and developer of curriculum and assessment materials. Before we get started, here are a few housekeeping details. After Kate's talk, we will have time for questions. If you have questions you want to ask, please write them in the question box on the lower left side of your screen. The author will answer questions at the end of her presentation. Some people using a telephone line may experience a slight delay. You will have the best experience using the sound on your computer. We want to remind you that we do not offer continuing education credits or certificates of completion for our webinars. The webinar will be recorded and you will be notified by email when it is available to view. Thanks again for joining us this afternoon. Now let's get started. Kate, over to you. Thanks, Holly, and greetings, everyone, and thanks for joining us for this second NAEYC webinar on making and tinkering with STEM. Since the book was released in January, I've been so excited to um, hear and see how it's being implemented in classrooms and in children's museums all over the country. Now, this resource contains 25 design challenges that use children's picture books as a springboard for making and tinkering and engineering experiences that build a really strong foundation for future learning in the STEM field. And as you dig in this book, I think you're going to see how the arts are integrated into each and every challenge. This book was developed with the early childhood audience in mind, preschool through third grade. And just know that this is not a scripted curriculum for you to follow, and it's not a cookbook with step-by-step -step directions. It's a resource to get you started and to spark your children's interests as well as your own. We hope that you're going to uh, that you'll take these activities and shape them and make them your own based on the children you work with, their interests, and the resources you have available to you and what's in your school and your community. So let's take a look at what we'll be talking about today. Here are a few of the big ideas that we're going to be covering and actually uncovering. I've already given you just a little taste of what making and tinkering with STEM is about. We're going to explore what you need to know about making, tinkering, and engineering, and how they're alike and how they're different. We'll take a look at how to create learning environments that inspire and motivate children to become deeply engaged in these activities. We'll walk through the design challenges in the book and see how they're structured. And finally, we'll take a, um, talk about a few tips for integrating these activities into your existing curriculum. And at the end of the webinar, as Holly said, we'll save some time for questions and answers. So let's talk for a minute about why this sudden interest in tinkering, making, and engineering in schools today, and what this looks like in early childhood. Here's an interesting fact for you. Um, did you know that roughly two-thirds of children in the elementary grades today will end up doing work that hasn't even been invented yet? Can you imagine? Roughly two-thirds of the children in the elementary grades will end up doing work that we don't even know exists yet. So if the purpose of education is to prepare children for life and work and citizenship, we have to prepare them to be creative thinkers and to be creative problem solvers so that they can tackle whatever new problem or whatever new technology comes their way. And as early childhood educators, we value that role of play as an important vehicle for learning. But we all know that all play is not created equal, is it? Certain types of play leads to creative thinking that will be necessary in the future. And this type of play involves curiosity and imagination, inventiveness, risk-taking, experimentation, problem-solving, persistence, all of those positive approaches to learning that our field has been embracing for so long. 
Now, this diagram on your screen is from the Boston Children's Museum book called Tinker Kit. And I do have um, a handout with all of these resources that I'll be mentioning um, to you today. And it's available on a tab on your screen. Uh, it, this diagram shows you the relationship between making, tinkering, and engineering. And as you can see, there's a lot of overlap. The backdrop for all of this is play and being playful. Now, the words making and tinkering are often used interchangeably, but actually there's some real subtle differences. Tinkering's nothing new. Think back to how humans began creating tools. They were tinkering. Um, tinkering is at the intersection of making and play, and it's really a mindset. It's about exploring the physical properties of materials and real tools. It's about figuring out how things work, how to put things together, how to take things apart. It's about using materials or an object in a different way than it was intended. Now, tinkering can be sort of silly and whimsical with no real purpose, but it's the process of getting there that's most important. Tinkering is about making mistakes, figuring out what went wrong, making adjustments or what we call iterations until you achieve the result that you were hoping for. Now, with making, children express intention. They have something in their mind they want to create. It could be a house, a crane, a purse, a shield. And making takes all kinds of forms, woodworking and crafts and sewing, cooking, and more. In making, the belief is that children construct knowledge most effectively when they're actively involved in constructing things with their hands. That is, they're makers of things. And this is called constructionism, a term coined by Seymour Papers. Now, in both making and tinkering, the questions come from the learner, don't they? I wonder what will happen if I turn this. Um, but here's a question for you. Um, can you make things without tinkering? And can you tinker without making things? And I think the answer to both of these is yes. Yeah. If I got a set of Legos that had the step-by-step -step instructions, I could follow every single one of those instructions and not tinker at all. Or I could be given a bin of Legos and want to create something on my own, and I might have to tinker a lot. So you can see that subtle difference. As early childhood educators, we value that role of play, don't we? Now, with engineering, you start with a problem to be solved. And the question asked is usually posed by someone else. Engineers face constraints or limitations such as time, money, and materials. Um, I always think of that scene from that old movie, Apollo 13, when the scientists dumped a box full of junk onto a table and told the engineers they had to figure out a way to fit a square shape into a round hole using nothing but the materials on the table. And they had a limited amount of time to complete the task in order to save the astronaut. Now that's a real engineering task. In early childhood, an engineering task could be something as simple as, can you use these materials to make a chair for baby bear that's strong enough to hold a weight, maybe a five pound weight? And one way you may think of these three ideas is on, a, is on a continuum. Tinkering has no parameters. Making has an end product in mind they want to create. And engineers begin with a problem that to be solved, and that problem usually comes from somewhere else. There's lots of things that you can do in your classroom, in and out of every day, um, to develop these skills. And if you're using some type of project-based investigation studies or a project approach, you're probably doing a lot of these kinds of things already, asking questions, formulating plans, making observational drawings, and so forth, and handling real tools. So let's dig a little bit deeper into tinkering. Think back to your childhood when you first took something apart or put something together. Did you grow up with a parent or a grandparent who liked to tinker or maybe a neighbor? 
one of my earliest memories of tinkering was when I came home from school, and this is going to tell you how old I am. When I came home from school and I had this brand new Etch-a-Sketch, and I saw my dad with it sitting on the coffee table upside down. He had taken the back of it off to figure out how the Etch-a-Sketch worked. And what I saw was I was mesmerized watching it. He, there was gray, this shiny gray powder, and he moved the knobs, and we watched um, these crossbars move with a little pointer attached that drew into this gray powder. Well, it was a fascinating experience, but unfortunately, we didn't put that back. He wasn't able to put that back together. But that's the mindset I grew up with, and, and what I was growing up around was this wondering how things work. You know, when I started this book a couple of years ago, I mainly focused on engineering tasks. You know, let's build a, um, a troll-proof bridge for the three billy goat scruff. However, I had this huge shift in my thinking after I began the book. And, and it happened when I took this free online course called The Fundamentals of Tinkering from the Tinkering Studio, uh, part of San Francisco's Exploratory Museum. And in that course, and, and I did this course because I was preparing for what we were going to put in a children's museum that I'm volunteering at. And in this course, I had to tinker. I was forced to tinker. And I learned about creating circuits and scribbling machines and sewn and paper circuits. And I took apart toys. I even taught myself how to solder, for heaven's sake. I experienced frustration when I couldn't get something to work, but I stuck with it. And I was so excited when it did work. It was fun. It was gauging and it was so fulfilling. So through this course, I began to embrace the value and the joy of tinkering. And I knew that tinkering had to be a part of this resource. So we went back to the book and we sort of revamped a little bit and, and reorganized things and really built that into uh, making and tinkering with STEM. So I really encourage, encourage you, as you do the design challenges in the book, um, Spend time in those classrooms, letting, giving children the opportunity to tinker and explore and um, play with materials before you jump into that design challenge. And the role you play in facilitating these experiences is just pivotal. Um, uh, it's so easy to jump in and try to solve the problem for them, but you really have to stop and wait and watch what they're doing and, and get them just on that edge and then if they get stuck, give them a hint, give them a, a, an open-ended question that will take them a little bit further. Um, some questions I like to ask are, how did you come up with that idea? What do you think would happen if? What was most surprising to you? If you could change one part of this, what would you do? What was the hardest part for you? So let's take a look at a couple of examples of some tinkering. You know, Taking apart things is at the heart of tinkering. In maker education, this is referred to as deconstruction. Notice I'm saying deconstruction and not destruction. It's about figuring out how things work. It also encourages us to fix things that break rather than just throwing them away. Taking things apart is a great way for children to learn to use and explore real tools and materials. Even choose to set up a fix-it shop in your classroom with broken toys or broken appliances, like an old clock or an old VCR. Of course, pay attention to safety and know which items are safe to put out. And I always cut the cords off for safety, and sometimes I loosen the screws or add a little WD-40 to make the screws come out easier, and those small, chunky screwdrivers fit nicely into the little one's hand. And when children take these old computers apart, as you can see in this picture um, on the right-hand side, they find all kinds of surprises inside, speakers and ribbons and more. And the young ones really, really love to take apart old keyboards, using screwdrivers to pop those keys off. And they talk about the letters and the numbers when they're popping them off. And then we turn that over and we unscrew and we discover this plastic circuit board inside. And I'm still learning because our, our maker shop specialist at the museum showed me how I could take that plastic circuit board and hook it up to a light bulb and light it up. So I'm still learning too. Harvest all these parts and have children sort them. But the sorting is a big thing that we do in early childhood. Save them and then upcycle them for an art project or another project later on. 
Now, on the left, this child is doing a toy take apart. And that is so inviting for young children. We take old um, battery-operated toys with movable parts that you find at a garage sale or thrift store or, or ask for donations. And children observe how that, ch that toy moves, and we record and write down what they say, if that toy actually does move. And then we let them feel the toy and feel what they predict is inside and draw a picture. They might feel a spring, and they might predict that a battery is in the leg. And then we begin taking it apart and discovering what's inside. And they are so excited when their predictions are correct. Uh, and we go back to that drawing that they made, and we correct those misunderstandings that they had. And then when we get it down to the bare parts, as you see in that bottom picture, that's a little doggy there. And we look at how the gears move and move the different parts of it. And we hook it up to a battery pack. It's just fascinating. And they are very interested in that. Beginning electronics um, is, is there's a way to involve young children in, in this whole idea of creating circuits. Uh, in an appropriate way. And um, the big idea with young children is just about open and closed circuits. So in the picture on the left, um, we use a, a little toy that's on the market called an energy stick. And it's a little plastic tube that has silver um, tape on the end and some little wires and a buzzer. And when children hold hands in a circle or just hold either end of it, it will light up and buzz. And if any child lets go of their hand, the, the uh, circuit is broken, and so it stops. And so they learn very quickly about an open, closed circuit with their bodies. And then on the right hand, the bottom right hand, these boys are working with circuit blocks. They're little wooden blocks that have battery packs and um, uh, motors and light bulbs and um, buzzers and so forth, you can make them or you can buy them already made. And I have that listed on that resource in the handout as well if you're, if you're wanting some pre-made ones. And then they use these uh, wires called alligator clips. And I find the regular alligator clips, they have a little pincher. The pincher looks like an alligator's mouth, sometimes hard for young children um, to pinch, but I found these that have a washer attached um, so that they can pinch it and uh, it's easier for them to operate. And I start out very simple. I give them a battery pack and a light bulb and two wires and say, can you light the bulb? And then I'll keep making it increasingly complex. Can you, can you make this motor turn? Can you light this buzzer? Then we'll add a switch and we'll keep going on. And then the top right corner, the little boy, is making a circuit with Play-Doh. It's called squishy circuits. And we explore many different ways to make circuits with paper circuits, sewn circuits, all kinds of circuits. And then this activity is something that uh, people of all ages seem to love, and it's called scribbling machines. And the task is still building on this idea of creating circuits. But um, the, the, the goal is to create a contraption that will move across a piece of paper and leave a mark in its path. And we give children a motor, a little piece of a glue stick, and a battery, and lots of loose parts and art materials to create this. And they work together. And it takes time, and it takes tinkering to create. And the drawing on the left is, the, is what happens after that's created. Um, and then, you know, uh, Mitch Resnick from uh, MIT talks about activities that have a low floor, high ceiling, and wide walls. And what that means is the low floor is that we can uh, bring it down so that there's an easy way to get started, and, and, but yet we can make it even more complex. And wide walls means that we can do many, many different things with it. And so that's how the activities in this book are structured. On the left, this is an easy version of a scribbling machine. We just took a pool noodle and cut it into pieces and took a dollar store electric toothbrush and put it in the middle of the, um, that vibrates, and put it in the middle of the pool noodle and used rubber bands to attach markers and laid it on the table. And the tinkering comes in adjusting the markers and ma to, uh, to, to make it slightly off balance. And then the bottom right picture shows a more complex idea 
for older children using Lego techniques to create linkages and to make very complex scribbling machines. So all of these are building off of that same idea. So making, uh, you probably heard about the maker movement. It has started as a grassroots movement in, in basements and garages and community centers. Uh, look at the, uh, DIY sites like Pinterest. I mean, it's, it's, the Internet has really opened up this whole idea of making and, um, to everybody. If you want to fix something, you can Google a, uh, and find a video of how to do it. The, uh, the movement has a potential to be a learning movement and a way to inspire creative thinking and problem solving. Um, making can be anything from sewing to woodwork and crafts to cooking. Just if you can imagine it, you can make it. It's about thinking with your hands, using your hands to express yourself. When people are making physical objects with their hands, they're more deeply engaged and, and they're learning more. Just think about the problem-solving skills and thinking that takes place when these children created these objects. There's a, there's a cell phone made out of a block of wood, uh, a jingle bell, an LED light, and some jewels that they used a, a low-temp glue gun to stick on. Or they made a god's eye wrapping that yarn or made flower vases using pool noodles. So they had an idea in their mind of what they wanted to create. Reusable resources are easy to come by and ideal for maker projects. And often it's the materials that inspire children of what to create. Just seeing a material might think of something that they want to make with it. Using reusable resources is not only good for the environment, but they help children become flexible thinkers. How can we use this familiar material in a different way? How many ways can I use a paper towel roll or an empty spool or that pool noodle? Um, now, if you really want to be inspired, I encourage you to watch the YouTube video called Kane's Arcade. Uh, have you seen it? It's a story of a boy who spent time in his father's repair shop creating arcade games made out of cardboard. Cardboard is plentiful, involves making, tinkering, and even a bit of engineering. And in October, the Imagination Foundation hosts a global cardboard challenge uh, where people all over the world are making games like skee-ball or um, uh, a labyrinth or a putt-putt golf course out of cardboard. Check it out. Your program may want to participate. Now, in our engineering activities in the book, we use an engineering design process. And there's lots of design pro models of this design process. But the one that we've used is that we pose a problem that characters face in storybooks. Uh, and then we ask children to think about it. And then we go to building or creating it, making it. And then we test it out and try it. And then if it doesn't work, we're going to revise it or we're going to think about how can we make it even better. And then we find a way to share what we've learned and communicate with others. Now, the learning environment um, is powerful, isn't it? And it has an impact on how we feel and how children learn. So in thinking about the learning environment, you want to consider how you set the stage so children can think creatively, take risks, solve problems. Now, making and tinkering and engineering activities can take place anywhere in your classroom. They can take place outdoors. They can take place in the block area. They can play, take place in the art area. It, they, you don't have to have a maker space, or a, uh, but many people do. Um, as you implement the design challenges in this book, think about where they typically might take place. So we have one challenge called a sturdy nest, and so that may take place outdoors. Or uh, a house for the three pigs may take place in the block area. Or yarn may, magic may take place in the art area. So I mentioned the word makerspace. It's a place where people gather to tinker, make things, invent, create, explore, make discoveries, and use a wide variety of real tools and materials. Now, there is no one magic formula for a makerspace. Everyone looks different. And every, everyone has different materials in it. Some classrooms are large enough to have a dedicated makerspace. 
And some schools have dedicated maker spaces in a library or a resource room down the hall where children go to make and tinker. If you have a small room, most of the materials can be found uh, probably somewhere between your art and your science area. And if you're in maybe in a primary grade that's not using learning centers, just be sure to organize your materials in logical places where children can see clear choices and can use those materials independently. Um, and if you set up a maker space in your classroom, introduce it just like you would any other learning center and introduce the materials just as you would any other material. Start small. You don't have to have every material in the world in there or every resource. So start small. Introduce a few materials to begin with. Let the children get accustomed to them. Teach them how to use these. Um, you know, it might be introducing a new tool. And then as their competencies grow and as their skills grow, add a few more. A good place to start is, is with whatever materials are needed in that design challenge. Um, model how to use those materials and the tools um, and scaffold them and challenge them in new ways. So most of the materials can probably be found in and around your classroom. As I said, start small and then you might think big. This is more developed, obviously, and have collected more materials over time. But those materials during the course of the year, it will grow. Uh, other places to acquire materials, donations from local businesses, reusable resources, uh, resource centers. I wish we had one of those in Baton Rouge. Garage sales, thrift stores. You can send a note home with parents and set up a collection box of things you want. And in the book, we have a list of materials that you might think about um, asking for. And then enlist the children's help in sorting and organizing materials. Talk about the ways that the materials might be used. Tinkering and making take time. And we want children to persist and come back to projects over time. So have a place to protect their materials, uh, a work in progress. Um, and this will help them build that perseverance and persistence. And I like to display materials where the children have choices and can see what's inside. Another thing that I've found helpful is putting out tinkering trays on tables. So I limit the possibilities, even though we have all of these materials. Here are some things to get started with. And you can use things like a cutlery drawer or a muffin tin or, or little snack baskets, those little cardboard snack baskets any kind of um, little containers to put out in the middle of the table to show them those possibilities. And this teacher in this classroom, uh, it was at the Judith Baker Child Development Center in San Francisco, had a focused maker space. Her class was really interested in, um, in the electronics and the circuits, and it ended up being a, a study of, of, of robots, actually. And so she organized her materials in that maker space around those ideas. Other materials were available for her to pull from if they asked, but this was sort of the setup that she chose. And if you look, she really did a nice job of organizing and displaying the materials. And here are her, her tinkering trays, and she organized them by electronic things and white things and shiny or metal things. It was very, very, very attractive, and children could use those familiar tools in, and materials in different ways. Uh, using real tools and materials involves letting children take and manage risk. Of course, your role as a teacher is to really teach children how to use those tools and materials safely. Children really feel empowered when they use those real tools. Um, that glue gun on the left, some of you may be gasping, but this is, a, um, I find, a, an appropriate one to use. It has, uh, you see that little rubber tip covering the metal at the end, it's a low temp glue gun and it uses super low um, temperature glue sticks. I have that resource uh, as an example of one on that handout as well. The other example of a new tool that I discovered the past year was something called a, a Clever Cutter, K-L-E-V-E-R Cutter. And it's a, um, if you notice, it's a way of cutting cardboard that children can use. Their fingers can't get up into that blade up there, and so they take that with adult supervision and pull that 
um, clever cutter across the cord cardboard. Again, feeling more empowered. So now let's take a look at some of the design challenges in making and tinkering with STEM. They are organized in um, the design challenges. I mentioned there are 25 of them. They are not designed in any order of complexity. They're, order, they're uh, organized in alphabetical order. Um, each design includes three aspects of maker education, tinkering, making, and engineering. And we want you to use them flexibly. Um, and see which one works in with your curriculum. And each, children, each challenge uses a child's picture book as a familiar starting point. And the books are a combination of, of classics like The Three Billy Goats Gruff and, and The Three Little Pigs, uh, all the way to, more, uh, to newer titles like Rosie Revere Engineer and Iggy Peck Architect. This, uh, the book this design challenge focused on is Rosie Revere Engineer. It's called Gizmos Galore. So in the book, we look at the problem the character faces in there. Most narrative books have a problem that the characters face. And we use that problem to set the stage for the design challenge. In this book, Rosie had dreams of inventing gadgets and gizmos and becoming an engineer. And then on that same page, we list lots of materials. Now, these are just suggestions. It doesn't mean you have to go and get every single list, but it gives you some ideas. Some of the materials are used for tinkering before you actually get into the design challenge, and others are used in the design challenge. Um, in this design challenge, we suggested setting up a, ta a take-apart table and let children investigate how things work and what's inside. And then on the design challenge, you'll find two elements, making and engineering. Now, the making task is what I call the easy peasy part of the challenge and a place to get started. So for your younger children, for those threes or fours, they may just be doing that making part. Uh, for this challenge, um, it, it has uh, find an everyday object and find ways to make it better. And the engineering part of it is a way to make it more um, complex and to improve an everyday object by making it lighter or smaller or more powerful or able to be used for more than uh, one purpose. So I call that engineering part the bring it on part. This is the, the more complex area. As you can see, the task is more complex. It uses parameters and limitations. And it's more appropriate for a little bit older children. So we've labeled the engineering aspects of the task for you in the design challenge. And in each design challenge, you'll also find suggestions of questions and comments that you might make and suggestions for going deeper by extending or expanding the topic. Now, if, if it were me and I were if back in the classroom and using this book, the first thing I would do is think about what my curriculum and what I'm doing. And if you're using studies or project approach or, or if you already know themes that you're using, currently using, create a list of those or, and then go through the book. And I took sticky notes and said, oh, okay, one on buildings, um, this, this might be I'm doing something on construction. So beautiful buildings or a house for three pigs might fit there. And just take a sticky note and put your topic that's in your curriculum. And if you're using an emergent curriculum and you are really following children's interests and as they unfold over the course of the year, just go back through and look and see where those design challenges fit. I bet you you can find one that you could work into your, um, your study or your project. So um, if you're going to be at NAEYC this year in Alexa Alexandria, in Atlanta, uh, we're going to be doing a um, pre-institute session, a pre-conference session on Tuesday. Um, we did a similar one like this in San Francisco at the Professional Learning Institute. And I can tell you, it was, it was highly interactive, engaging, and, and yes, it was fun. Um, the day is on that Tuesday, and there is a separate fee for that workshop. And if you want to find more information about this, there's a tab on your webinar screen that will link you to a page on NAEYC's website where you can learn more about that 
session, and uh, there's also a place for you to register. So um, at this time, uh, I will open it up for questions. You know, I think um, by intentionally including making and tinkering and engineering in your early childhood program, you're not only helping build a strong foundation for STEM, but you are developing skills for children to be creative, innovative, thinkers, and successful learners. Um, so Holly and Cassandra, I'll turn it over to you. And if, if people have questions, I'll be willing to try to take a stab at answering them. Thank you, Kate. We do have a few questions from listeners. The first one is, okay. do you have to worry about letting children take apart electronics? What about safety from electric shocks? <laughs> well, as I said, you first you cut the cords off. And there is a list of things, and I have that in, in, in the book, of things that you don't want to take apart. You don't want to take apart something with a monitor, and there's some combustible things that you don't want. But a keyboard um, is, is completely safe. And um, we've taken apart the um, uh, VCRs. And um, if, you're, if you're really uh, nervous about it, do clocks and things like that. Um, but and and you know ask people ask look up the resources about what's safe and what's not, and um, we put goggles on on the kids as well. Thank you. Another listener would like to know: um, Can we turn our art center into a maker space? It would be great to move away from some of the more typical art materials. Sure, you can. I mean, you as I said, you can do it anywhere, um, and a lot of if, if I thought about where all of the materials for these making and tinkering activities happen, it's usually going to happen between the art area uh, or the science area. Some teachers position those in their classroom, those two centers, close by so that they can, uh, they may be borrowing materials from one area to the other. Um, but you can offer those opportunities for both and have lots of choices in that area. Okay, um, another listener would like to know, what can parents include in a makerspace at home, particularly for toddlers? I saw something on, you know, if you think about toddlers and um, that it's, it's all about cause and effect and problem solving that they're doing. They're pushing buttons. They're opening and closing things. They're taking things apart. I even saw the other day, and I thought this was a great um, um, activity of, they had a child in a high chair or an activity table, and they had taken colored um, popsicle sticks or tongue depressors and had taped them down with, with tape, just little pieces of tape. And that child was spending so much time just trying to take apart and pull that tape off. But just to think about putting things together and taking things apart and how that can happen and all those those toys and just loose parts that they can do that with. It, it's, uh, they're doing a lot of that already, I would imagine. And a couple listeners have asked about tools. Um, what other real tools have you introduced to children, and what would you suggest for preschoolers in terms of real tools? Um, screwdrivers. <laughs> and again, all of this with supervision. Um, I've used uh, a battery-operated handheld um, screwdriver, and again with the goggles. When we turn that um, keyboard over, their tiny screws and their fine motor skills are a little bit hard to um, work those little tiny screwdrivers, but they can hold that um, handheld battery-operated screwdriver and hold it down and unscrew those pieces. They're small parts, so when I have like a little metal um, magnetic tray that we put those pieces in, and you have to know your children about who puts things in their mouth and the small parts, so you have to be cautious there. Um, uh, hammering with, um, again, with supervision, hammering golf tees into styrofoam or, or um, sheetrock nails into a, um, a, a tree stump. You know, there's lots of, uh, of things that, that you can do with that. Okay. Um, how have you married making and tinker tinkering with nature? 
We are a full immersion nature preschool and kindergarten and would love to incorporate more making and tinkering without the scope of within the scope of our current vision and mission. Here, I'll give you an example of one. Remember the scribbling machines that I showed you a while ago? I saw an example, and I'm anxious to try it. It was called Nature Box, and it was taking that same motor and the battery and um, hooking it up to sticks and leaves and making this whole, uh, you know, and bringing out some googly eyes and making that uh, uh, a nature bot, a little creature out of, out of sticks and twigs and all of those kinds of things. But also, I mean, just think about all the, the making and tinkering that you can do in nature, taking sticks and, and branches and doing weaving and mobiles and all of those things are part of the maker um, education movement as well. Okay, here's another question. Um, is it okay that the children start to play with the STEM materials they're given? Uh, for example, they have small blocks to build and then they start using them as baby beds for dolls that are on the other side of the room. Well, that's what, I mean, you have to do, let them explore things first and they are making and creating. It may not be what's on your agenda right there, but in their mind, if they're making that bed, they are creating and they are making. It may be not the direction you were going in, but um, yes, I think it's okay. They need to play with those things. Later, you may be able to introduce something, and it may it may take a different thing if we're, they're making the beds. Maybe they're going to make a room. Maybe we can figure out a way to add a light to this. Um, so there's different ways that, that you can uh, put a twist to it. Um, another listener says, I started a take-apart center this year in my gifted pre-K class. There isn't any interest in this center. Is it maturity? I have a variety of toys and electrical items and tools there. What do you think I might be missing? I think um, the first thing, I think it's good. You know, uh, sometimes people say, oh, don't put out any examples. Uh, I think examples are good. It gives the people, gives children a place to get started, and then they can um, do it on their own. So sometimes they're not knowing what you're wanting to do. So I would uh, create something on your own. You know, you as an adult, take something apart. Do it with them. Be the, oh, my goodness, look what we've discovered. Um, also taking apart and making those predictions. Um, if they're not interested, you know, Put it away. <laughs> Put it away if that's not if they're not at that point in, in time. Um, they may they may be upset about taking apart that that uh, favorite toy or something like that. But we have to really tell them these were thrown away, and um, some of them may get upset with that. So uh, know your children, and if that's not appropriate, look at look for something else that they don't get attached to to take apart. Kate, can you expand more on how you recommend introducing the engineering design process to children? It's a new way of doing things for so many teachers and students. So, um, all right, so we've, you've read the book, you know, so, um, and you've talked, you know, on the first day you might read the book and talk about it, and you talk about the problem uh, that they, um, that the character in the book um, started with. Um, and then you brainstorm with them and think about how might they solve that problem. What are some ideas that they might have? You could have children, if they're at that age, to either draw or tell you about how, or, or dictate a story or something about what they're going to do, thinking about the materials. And then let them create. Show them the choices of materials that are available. And they may ask you for other things. So you're a resource person that can, can, if they need something else that's not out in that tinkering tray, you could go find something and bring it to them. Um, and so they build and create. And then they try it. And they had an idea of what it was supposed to do, and it didn't do that. So then you ask questions. What do you think happened? I wonder what would happen if. And try to help them solve that problem themselves. It's really, really, really easy to jump in and fix it for them. But let them struggle with it 
And it's not a fast thing to go through. It takes time. It takes this whole um, thought process of trying to figure out what, what's wrong and trying different things and something new may come out of that. And then um, after they've tried it, they look at it and they say, well, I mean, they may ask somebody, what, what would you do to make it better or how, what would you do differently? And then sharing it with other people or communicating it. It might be with a family member or uh, another classmate or, or something, uh, someone around the, uh, down the hall from them. So thinking about the way. So in that way, we thought about the problem. Um, we built something. We tried it. We tested it. It didn't work or it did work, and we had another idea to make it better, and then we shared what we did. And, it's a, and children this age, it's not a linear process. They may go back and forth um, in one section over and over, do something, try something, uh, and it's not a real linear. But usually by the time the whole project is over, you probably have hit all those elements in there. hope that makes sense. Kate, we have time for about one more question. Um, what ideas do you have for creating a partnership between pre-kindergarten students and elementary students in relation to making and tinkering? Oh, I mean, it's a perfect opportunity. And it's, um, the, um, the scribbling machine that I showed you earlier was actually done in a partnership between a kindergarten class and a high school art class. And it was actually, we have a video on NAEYC's website on their blog, and I've got that on that resource list, so you can learn more about that. But what was so interesting is that they, um, the, the older students each had a buddy in the kindergarten class. And it was nice because if they had a problem or had a, uh, a stum stumbled with some fine motor skill, the older um, child could help out. But what was so fascinating to me watching this was that the younger children, the kindergartners, were more willing to take risk than the older children, than the older high school students. They came in there pretty confident, oh, we're going to help these little kindergartner kids with this. And they actually struggled in getting those scribbling machines to move across the paper. And they had to tinker with it. And and they were more quick to say, I can't do this, what should I do next? Whereas the younger kindergarten students were more willing to take risks and try different things. It was fascinating. So it makes a perfect opportunity for older students and younger students to work together. Or doing things with families and, and children. Or having a tinker night uh, and doing things together. It's all about collaboration and working together. Well, Kate, thank you so much for um, doing this webinar today and helping everybody understand a little bit more about making and tinkering and getting us all excited. This will end our webinar. We thank everyone for listening today. Um, just as a reminder, the handout is available on the left-hand side of your screen. And do check out the pre-conference tab at the top of your screen if you're interested in learning more about Kate's pre-conference workshop she'll be holding in Atlanta in November. Thank you, everyone.